Good. Thanks very much. I think a lot of people are still out there coffee drinking, so I assume they will come back in later, but let's just get going. We have a pretty tight schedule, so I will talk about Alp and SL Linux one year later. So, brief introduction to myself, because I'm here for the first time and I really like it here. It's a very nerdy thing. It's awesome. <laughs> My name is Johannes Segitz. I'm a security engineer working at SUSE. I'm located near Nuremberg in Germany, so I'm there at the office from time to time. I do code review, although nowadays I mostly lack the time for that. I do product pen testing, so before we release a product, I have a look at the product from an offensive point of view, if we actually fixed everything. I'm an SL Linux expert, and I'm the lead of the engineering red team, so we do internal attack simulations against our own infrastructure to identify issues. And a quick disclaimer, so you might have seen the gag in the uh, first slide. So I use the old names. So the first reasons for that is I submitted the talk with this title, so I can't just willy-nilly change it. But I also kind of lost track of the names. So I will probably learn them when we ship them to the customers, because then we can't change them anymore. So quick outline, I will give you a really, really quick introduction into the SUSE product security team, because probably not always, uh, everyone knows us. I will give you a really, really quick as a Linux refresher, but really only the absolute basics. And then I will talk about Alp and SL Linux, what worked well, um, what are the challenges that we've seen, especially in last year, and what to expect in the futures going forward. So this is a product security team. The important point here is the product security team, because by now we have a couple of security teams. So there's a, a security team for Rancher, for example. We have a cyber security team that is responsible for our IT infrastructure. So we are responsible for the traditional SUSE products. Huh? Please don't send us phishing reports. We get them all the time. Don't do this. Cyber security team. We are split up in two groups. We do reactive security. So that means that we analyze security issues that we get reported either via public sources or via pri uh, private sources. And we do incident handling for that for SUSE and open SUSE. So that's the classical CVE comes out, we patch that stuff. Then we do proactive security. So this is the security work that we do mostly before shipment, code review, hardening, all of that stuff. The goal here is to reduce the work for the reactive people. So everything that we can harden up front, we try to do. There are, of course, certain limits for a general purpose operating system. It's mostly a fun place to work unless someone discovers a backdoor right before Easter holidays. <laughs> Not fun. Or if the kernel team decides to issue a dozen of CVEs every day. I think for the kernel people here in the room, it's probably also not much fun. But this is currently a bit challenging. So the really quick basic, uh, as a Linux refresher, um, the basic idea is type enforcement. Every object on the system, and that really means almost every object that you have on the system, has attached a user, a role, a type, a sensitivity, and a category. And if you put this then all together, then this forms the so-called security context. So this is the full form of a security context. Sometimes a little bit shorter because you, for example, don't necessarily need to have the categories. But then you do access control from one security context to the other security context. And this is rather long and complicated, but the good news is you can ignore pretty much everything apart from the type <coughs> in almost all situations. And the type also usually has a proper name. So the SSH daemon, for example, runs in the type sshd underscore t. If you see a massive mismatch between the type and the program that is running, then you likely have some SL Linux problem. But you probably noticed already because something broke. So let's go over what works well. Um, the biggest change probably is that this is not just my side project anymore. It has been the case for a long time, but by now we have a full-time policy maintainer, Kathy Hu, sitting there. So please realize... <laughs> and she's really doing an awesome job, so realize I'm not a policy maintainer. Talk to her. <laughs> no, just joking. You can also talk to me, but um, this is really a good move because I worried that we would move to SL Linux without someone that can really de dedicate time to that. And I'm really happy that the company saw the need for that. I told them multiple times. So, yeah. 
Then we by now also have regular meetings on Monday at 3.30, um, where we sync up with other interested parties. Usually three to six people join. In case you're interested in joining that and just ping me, then we will invite you. Depending on how high, high the level of interest is, we might also move this to a different place because currently we do that in Google Meet. If there are people that would be interested from the community or something like that, then of course we can also change that. We have an improved JIT-based workflow. So previously we had just patches in our packages and quite a number of them. And we changed that now. So we use the Fedora JIT as our upstream. Um, there's also the so-called reference policy and we consider for a while what to take here. But the Fedora policy is very polished and provides a better user experience for our users. So we use them as our upstream and then for the individual branches or the individual code streams, we use branches and have all of the patches in there by now. So the packaging step is rather simple. Now you just call a script, everything gets updated automatically, you build it and then you have your policy. So you mostly work on JIT now. Then we have a monthly as a Linux patch day. So we stole that from Microsoft. Um, we need to sync up with the Fedora policy from time to time and we don't want to do this um, only like once a year because then it will become very unwieldy and also we want to get the changes that they have. Um, this monthly cadence I think works out rather fine. Most of the time it's not really intrusive, not this month, but most of the time. Then luckily the knowledge of SL Linux improved a lot in the company. Um, so first of all we noticed that by just getting better bug reports. It used to be the case that we got a report like, my system broke, yeah, awesome. <laughs> and then we had to do a couple of round trips and by now we get bug reports where we have a lot of the information already up front. Of course, we still need to ask, but for the most part it works fine. Also, more people know what to look for when something breaks. Because that is the unfortunate thing about SL Linux that people that have not worked with SL Linux before, they just notice that something doesn't work and they do their usual Linux debugging dance and they can't figure out the problem. And then they learn that it's SL Linux and then they start to hate SL Linux because they had to do that. So fortunately, most people now realize that if something breaks and they can't figure out what the reason is, they disable SL Linux for a second, try it again, it works, okay, they know it's SL Linux. We also see fewer horrible hacks because especially in the beginning, people were trying to work around SL Linux a lot. You know? And this is kind of understandable because it is a new system, it's also not something that comes very natural, um, but people really did things that yeah, were not nice. And we see still some of that, but it's not as bad as it used to be a year ago. I think the training sessions that we offered probably helped, um, but people also just learned on their own. I think this is one of the awesome things that we have within SUSE, that usually you have time to learn things. And people took the opportunity there, um, still more training would probably be helpful. So, what also works well is that if you use OpenSUSE Tumbleweed or the whole ecosystem around that, or Slee Micro, the current versions, or Alp, or whatever, um, then you can expect a rather decent default behavior. That means if you don't do anything spectacularly different, then you should probably not notice SL Linux too much. For the people in this room, this is probably not a valid sentence because you by definition do things that are not like normal, <laughs> but for most other people it works. It still depends on having basic SL Linux knowledge. And a canonical example here is, so you're an old school web guy, you still build your web pages manually, you create a web page in your home directory, you move it to the server root and it doesn't work. And the reason is with AppArmor, everything is uh, path-based, so that would work. But with SL Linux, the type gets attached to the file. It's tagged as something in a user home directory. And the web server should not be able to read user home directories. You can configure it like that, but that's not a default. So for most people, that is tricky. And then there's this magic capital set flag that either displays information about SL Linux or it tells tools to do the right thing. Yeah? So this is the most important thing to know about as Linux capital set. I also think that bug triage works mostly fine. We have the big advantage that we just have to monitor for bugs with the title as Linux and that catches pretty much everything. 
Um, seems to be a rather natural title to put it in, uh, natural thing to put it into the title and then rant about as a Linux. So we just search for that daily, we prioritize it and then distribute it in the group um, to get it fixed. And by now we are at a point where I would say that the usual problems get fixed rather quickly. At least on our end, of course, an update then still has to be released that can add some delay. But most of the issues that we see regularly and unfortunately can't really solve in a generic way but have to work through um, are fixed uh, quickly. Feature work itself is mostly done by the future technologies uh, team and by the kernel team. The kernel team working on the kernel side of SL Linux, of course, and the future technology team is the people who actually use that stuff. Yeah? Um, from time to time we have to coordinate there, but most of the time we can work in isolation on our policy and not really sync up here. So, what are the challenges? One challenge definitely is a massive lack of knowledge with some customers. And that's not very surprising, because if someone has been a SUSE customer for a long time, they either used AppArmor or they did not use AppArmor at all or were not aware of that. And as a Linux is not a skill that you just have as a normal Linux person. Yeah? So this will need some help also from our side. Then audit to allow gone wild. So audit to allow is a tool that allows you to take as a Linux denials and then it will propose you the rules that you need to uh, implement to allow this kind of access. And this can be helpful, but the problem is that of course you need to be a bit careful as long as it's a security technology and your first answer should not be, well, allow everything. Huh? It's like driving with your car, hitting some tree and deciding, well, the problem wasn't by driving style or anything, I just get a tank and run over the tree. Yes, it works, but maybe not the solution. Then something that bites a lot of people, privileged containers, they have the type SPC underscore T, not the greatest name ever, but historically um, there they are not all powerful. Most people expect that if I spin up a privileged container, it will be able to do everything. And this is not true. No? You can exempt your containers from SL Linux confinement and then you really can do everything that you want to do. But by default, even privileged containers are contained by SL Linux. No? And this is something that catches a lot of people by surprise, understandably, but everyone needs to learn that. <laughs> Then we have a pretty tight coupling between some rancher policies and the container as a Linux module. Um, they use some of the types without any abstractions in there and because of that, if we change something in container as a Linux, then from time to time we break their policies. So this just needs to be improved on their side to improve the um, rancher policies to abstract a little bit more. And of course, we have breakage for less use and therefore less tested functionality. So if you work exactly as I do, then you're fine. <laughs> but if you do different things, then you might come to a place where something has never been tested before. And even there, most of the things should work fine. But the more esoteric you get, of course, the higher the chances are that you find some breakage. And we just have to work through this and fix this one by one. Also, the majority of bugs currently handled by two people and sometimes we run into bandwidth issues, especially if we have peaks. So QA testing happens in intervals. Apparently, at least we get the bugs in, in certain intervals. And then from time to time, we get a lot of them and then it's tricky to provide the same level of service because we have to work through this mountain of bugs that we get at a certain point. On a technological side, the main issue really is our usage of ButterFS. So the one of the biggest problems is that SL Linux is not namespaced. If you run on a transactional system and you prepare a new snapshot, you go in there and optimally, especially if you do a big update, you would be able to load an SL Linux policy just in there to operate with this updated SL Linux policy. But you can't do that because if you would do that, then the SL Linux policy would also be valid outside. So this is a bit tricky. Then um, overlay FS in general can be tricky. Um, you know, we use that intensively um, on these transactional systems and as a Linux and overlay FS is not like the dream combination. There's some complex access control logic that's not directly visible to the user and that especially bit us when kernel underscore T got confined a little bit more. 
because previously it was unconfined, but when it became confined, then this became an issue with the way that we set up our, uh, our overlay FS mounts. Um, we do that in init RD without a policy loaded, and it's like be, uh, being between a rock and a hard place. There are no really awesome solutions at the moment. But overall, there were really fewer problems than I expected, because like one and a half years ago, I was a bit doom and gloom, like this is going to get really interesting, maybe I should look for a new company. <laughs> but it worked out fine-ish, I would say, and I think going forward, this will probably continue like that. So what to expect? More SL Linux denials. You can all expect this, you will see this constantly. Joking, but not really joking, you will just have to live that, with that. Um, where we want to improve is we want to work closer with upstream, so we have a few changes that could definitely be upstream because it would benefit also the Fedora or other upstream users, um, and it would reduce the work for us over the long term. Um, this is just something where the priorities have not been set at. Um, we want to improve our collaboration with Rancher. It's a bit unclear how to do that because we are rather busy, so we can't just take the policies and do it for them. They are also rather busy, so we need to figure out a better way, but breaking their policy regularly is also very suboptimal. Then um, there will be an option to set the initial SID in the kernel, so when the policy is not loaded, there's a special type that is used to do access control, and then when you load the uh, policy later on, this can cause issues with overlayFS, there's now a possibility in the kernel uh, to set this initial SID and this might make our overlay FS problems less annoying. This is something that we just have to play around with. Um, I got a booting kernel two weeks ago and yeah, have yet to find time to play around with that because XSET was not exactly planned for. Then we want to do additional training offers. So we want to repeat the existing sessions. There is a, a training for beginners, there's an intermediary training and we also want to offer an advanced training. Uh, so currently the intermediary training teaches you to debug common as a Linux problems, but it was not teach you to um, write an as a Linux module, module. And this is not something that is easy. Uh, um, so this was requested a couple of times, but first of all, we need to prepare it and then we need to have time to actually do these trainings. Um, yeah, let's see, I hope to be able to do it this year. Also improved documentation. So rather recently, um, the OpenSUSE wiki here was improved by Kathy and William Brown. Um, if we want to help our customers, then we need to improve our documentation, um, offer additional training. I think this is just something that we need to work with um, because we can't magically expect that people just know how to use SL Linux. And for important technology, I think that SL Linux really has extremely bad documentation. Uh, um, it's rather rare that you have a technology that's widely used and you really don't have good books about it. Uh, there are books, but it's not like you have 10 good books that you can recommend for something like that. Then we want to improve our packaging. So at the moment we store our policy in varlib as a Linux and this is not great for transactional systems because uh, you should not touch var. At the moment, there's a hack in there for us so that we are still able to do that. Um, we likely will be able to just move it somewhere else and that should hopefully not be a too big thing. And then we can remove the hack. We also provide Python packages. And with these Python packages, um, we need to move to the new way of packaging Python packages. Um, we tried twice, we failed twice. Um, Let's see, this is something that we want to do in the long term to provide uh, support for multiple Python versions. At the moment, we are at a point where either we can go to the modern packaging or we keep support for older systems and this is not really an awesome choice. And then we want to have a CI-CD pipeline, so we already have the stuff in Git, but at the moment you then have to do some manual steps to actually get a policy for testing. And of course it would be much nicer to just be able to commit something and then you get a policy package and can play with that. No. An interesting topic is the migration path from AppArmor based less to as a Linux based less. So um, there was a working group about migration paths. 
still under the old ALP plan. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure if this is something that will come up or not, but to some extent we still have to think about it. And uh, unfortunately, Matthias is nodding, so... <laughs> So the, the happy path, of course, here is um, you just have uh, a default AppArmor installation, then it's not a big deal. But as soon as the customer touched his AppArmor installation, then it's going to get rather rough. These two systems are absolutely not compatible. Uh, it's not doable to find a generic solution here. But I think we should at least try to find a solution for the most common modifications that a customer did. Uh, so just because they modified like one line in their AppArmor profiles should not mean that they are not able to migrate. No? Um, but how we do this, uh, it's an open question and we will need to figure this out. If you want to contact us, then you can either join Discuss as in Linux on Slack. Um, so we hang out there and we also discuss there. There's also this meeting reminder, so in case you're interested in a meeting, then uh, you will see it there every Monday. And there's a mailing list, slinux at suse.de. At the moment, we do our bug triage there, so we send uh, slinux bugs there daily um, because there's not much discussion. If that changes, then we might move our triage somewhere else and just keep the discussion there, or maybe people are interested in seeing the bugs. I don't know. Let's see. It's all stuff that we need to figure out. And with that, thank you for your attention. I actually was worried about a 30 minute slot and I sped up a lot, and now I sped up a little bit too much, so we have time for questions. <laughs> oh, I remember one of the problems from the Apartment days were that we were kind of switching between two approaches between the Apparmer profiles being part of the respective packages like Samba or other demons, or being it uh, some global Apparmer profiles package. Neither worked really well because uh, one of them broke whenever the demon was updated mm -hmm. and maintainer of that demon was not using Apparmer, so didn't notice something broke. The other didn't work well. Uh, something in the global infrastructure changed. So uh, I assume uh, you are going to have the same kind of problems because many of the daemon maintainers will not be, or so package maintainers won't be aware of SE Linux policies. So do you have some strategy how to approach this problem? We have exactly that problem. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really have a good solution for that. So the current plan um, by upstream, so Fedora mostly says, well, we put this into the packages themselves because the package maintainer knows their demons. So they know what to change when the daemon changes. Um, with as a Linux, it's even a bit more tricky than with Abamo because even just if the glibc changes, then it might change the syscalls that your daemon does. And then your as a Linux module might break. That is very unlikely with AppArmor, but it happens with as a Linux. Huh? Um, the assumption based on that, that the maintainer knows how to do that, I think is not really a good assumption. So there are maintainers that know what they're doing there, but most of the time they don't, and also causes additional problems. So for example, there is this dedicated container as a Linux module, which is copied into the main policy package <laughs> because the main policy package does not build without it. And I tried to convince them, well, if the package does not build without it, maybe it should be part of the main policy, but they don't agree. So we still live with that, and I think that going forward, it will still be the case that we will have some of, or we will have most of the policy modules just within the main policy. And then for some packages, it will be um, in the package itself. My preference would be to keep it all within the policy package, um, but that will also not happen, and it also definitely has drawbacks, huh? because you really need to have a good understanding of a certain daemon to be able to confine it, and it's definitely not the case that I know every software by heart. Yeah? I mean, I just uh, learn as much as possible and then try to fix it, but I will never get to the level of understanding of a good maintainer. Any other questions?
Okay. Yeah, then thank you for attending and uh, awesome Labs conference. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>